The Sunday Baroque podcast is made possible by WSHU and the Friends of Sunday Baroque. You can find out more about the Friends of Sunday Baroque and find out how to become one yourself by visiting our website, sundaybaroque.org, under the Contact tab. plays viola da gamba, violone, baroque bass, medieval fiddle, and she's performed with ensembles such as Boston Camerata, Washington Bach Consort, New York Collegium, the Folger Consort, and the acclaimed medieval music group Sequentia, and many, many other prestigious musical groups across the globe. She has also been on the faculty of the Amherst Early Music Summer Festival and the Viola da Gamba Society of America Conclaves. Pat Neely, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. So I just, I'm astounded by the many musical accomplishments you have, and there's so much there, but I'd like to go back to the very beginning and ask you to talk about your path as a musician, literally from the very beginning. Mm-hmm. Like, what what instrument did you start on? How did you get into music? Did you start, did you have a musical family? Well, um, I started out as a pianist. I started out like everyone else started playing piano um, when I was seven, mm-hmm. and I had an uh, an aunt who was an organist, and um, my mother was not musical, but she admired the, my aunt and thought, "Okay, well, you know, let's 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 see what Patricia can do." So um, I studied piano for several years, um, from seven uh, through high school. I auditioned and uh, was accepted at uh, LaGuardia High School in New York, which at that mm-hmm. time was called Music and Art. Mm-hmm. high school. Um, I, but when you audition as a pianist, they assign an orchestral instrument to you, and you do not have a choice. And they assign the French horn to me, which I resented because I w- was not in any shape to play an instrument that difficult. It was, ext- you know, you, the mouthpiece, the amount of air you had to use. I mean, I just wasn't focused on that. Um, But my mother said that if I didn't stay there, she would send me to boarding school. (laughs) So (laughs) I made the best of it. And I started to, I really began to enjoy the whole idea of playing with other people. As a pianist, you're always uh, playing by yourself and um, being involved in an orchestra and getting to collaborate with other people was actually of the what I really enjoyed about that experience. But during that those years and in college, I had to find my instrument. So I started playing a number of instruments. A lot of, I started with wind instruments. I played the flute for a while. I, pl- I studied the oboe for a while in college. But I had a um, a house fellows in my dorm. This is at Vassar College, who was the choir director. And his wife at that time played the viol. He played recorder, and he would occasionally have uh, concerts in our living room, which I would attend, and I became smitten with the viol. Hmm. And that same year I was in the choir, we did the St. Matthew Passion, and I heard the solos for voice and viol, and I thought, that's it. So I started studying the viol when I was a junior in college with the same teacher as uh, the choir director, Jameson's Marvin's wife at that time, Mary Beth. And I traveled back and forth uh, to New Haven and studied with Grace Feldman. And then after Vassar, I um, decided to Uh, There was a master's program in historical performance at Sarah Lawrence with the New York Pro Musica. So I decided to apply and and enter that program, and I began studying with Judith Davidoff. Mm -hmm. And it turns out everybody who played the viol knew everybody else, and Grace Feldman and Judith were in the same group, the New York Concert of Viols. Mm -hmm. So I I was introduced to this world um, in a very... Um, a matter-of-fact way. I thought anyone could find 
early music, you know, to play. And, and I also had two professors at Vassar who were really well known in their field of early music. Janet Knapp, who was a medievalist, she had done a lot of work on the 13th century conductus. And I took a class with her where we transcribed um, chant from the Old Hall manuscript and we sang it. And every time I mentioned that with my colleagues from the alums that were in that class with me, we all remember it distinctly. It was a very special moment in our lives to be able to do that with her. And then I had Edward Riley, who translated the treatise on playing the flute by Quantz, mm -hmm. which was and still is the sort of Bible of performance practice. Mm -hmm. And he would always quote from it. So I just assumed every college had a, <laughs> a, a specialist in early music. Um, and after I, um, uh, after Sarah Lawrence, I spent some time trying to to perform in New York, and it was very difficult for me. Um, everyone was saying, well, it's because you grew up here. You know, um, I wasn't really taken seriously, um, and that always baffled me. Anyone who came from another state and came to New York um, always ended up doing the things that I wanted to do. So at some point I thought, okay, well, um, let's think about leaving New York. And uh, at some point, I uh, I found out that Sequencia was looking for a medieval fiddle player. And I went in and talked to them and played a little bit. And um, they invited me to join them oh. in Cologne, which I did for three years. Mm -hmm. And it was great. Um, I learned it was the most... Um, intense experience I'd ever had musically. Uh, we rehearsed all day, every day, mm -hmm. five days a week. Maybe we had a, a, a day off. Mm -hmm. um, we were constantly on tour. I learned to accompany a singer like Barbara Thornton, um, which to this day I can accompany any singer. I feel that confident about it because of the intense um, uh, experience I had with both Ben and Barbara. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 uh, a lot of it had to do with the fact that they lived the, in the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. They really had an affinity for this music, especially Barbara. Mm -hmm. And their theories involved in how to execute the music were very clear in their head, and they were able to communicate that. Mm -hmm. But eventually, I, I, um, I had um, also started playing a little bit of violone there because a friend of mine um, was a double bass and violone player with Music Antique Kyun, and he had a lot of work with them, so he started giving me some of his other work uh, mm -hmm. around town. And I fell in love with, I said, well, I'm missing out. If I'm only playing m music from the Middle Ages, I'm missing out on a whole you know, era of music in the Renaissance and Baroque periods. So um, I, I actually came back to New York um, for several reasons. One, my mother is very sick, and um, I wanted to be here for her because I knew that uh, eventually um, this would be something that would haunt me if I hadn't come back. Mm -hmm. um, and so she um, uh, occupied a great deal of my time when I came back, but I also began uh, playing a little bit more Baroque music. Mm -hmm. And um, I felt like I was getting the kind of experience I wanted. It's just that I had to travel for it. I had to do a little bit more work than other people who were just sitting in New York and um, were going from one gig to the next. Mm -hmm. I just had to live that life of having to, if I really wanted it, and if I was really serious about it, I would seek it out anywhere. And so I did. Wow. <laughs> what a great story. My gosh. Um, I, I just I have so many questions that are coming to my mind as you're speaking. And, and one of the things that sort of jumps out at me is, you know, piano. So you probably didn't play much, if any, Baroque music, right, as a pianist. And, you know, you're a kid. Yeah. So, you know, you're, you're sort of learning the, the basics. Mm -hmm. And then French horn, of course, <laughs> orchestral music. Um, so when you got to uh, playing the viol, like, 
was it the instrument or was it the repertory or was it because you mentioned hearing those mm -hmm. viol and, and voice sections you know was it or was it the whole thing like what do you remember do you know do you know what it was that was the thing that connected with you and and really gave you that passion for this this genre? Yeah, well, even uh, with play, playing French horn, um, I played in a brass ensemble, mm -hmm. and a lot of the music that we played was was Renaissance. We did oh. Gabrielli. Oh, sure. um, and I remember when we got to Rika, I had no interest any longer. That was too late for me. Huh. So it was this little segment of um, late Renaissance um, a music on brass mm -hmm. that that it, it it spoke to me in some way, mm -hmm. and also I had a teacher, and this was very interesting. I had an African American music history teacher there who um, said that his influence was uh, Macho. Oh, and he explained um, why. He said that you know in jazz. There are certain elements that of, of, of composing that require a lot of mathematics. Mm -hmm. And he said that's what spoke to him. Machaud's uh, music was extremely mathematical as well as creative. Mm -hmm. um, he um, had us listen to Ma Fan et Ma Commencement, and he explained how, cre how uh, quirky it was um, and the way it was composed. And, and then he um, introduced a piece to us that he had written in the style of a concerto grosso, but he called it concerto grosso in D blues. Oh. He wrote this, this is William Fisher. He wrote this for the Herbie Mann Quartet and an orchestra, and they premiered it at our, um, at our school. Mm -hmm. So I knew what the form was, but, I, but my first concerto grosso that I heard was a jazz piece. <laughs> Um, and I'd also received a recording of music um, of uh, the group that David Monroe um, was um, director of. And, mm -hmm. and it was a sampling of all different instruments. So I got a chance to hear the spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it, 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 it's really something that I continue to gravitate to. Mm -hmm. And then I had a godmother who sang Messiah every year. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> she would have me accompany her while she worked on her solos. Oh. So, you know, um, my choices were were deliberate when I was a child. I mean, the latest um, composer I ever listened to was Beethoven. Mm -hmm. I, I listened to all of his symphonies, my mother said, when I was younger and, and mm -hmm. it had my own names for them. But when it came to early music, that's when I never went any further forward in music history. Yeah. I started looking backward in time. How fascinating. <laughs> I, I find, you know, I, I've interviewed many musicians who specialize in, in playing period instruments. And and all, all, to a person, they all say kind of what you said in that they get to a point and, and they fall in love. You know, they discover this is their perfect fit, whatever instrument it might be. But, you know, as I said, when you were speaking, I really got the sense that it was not just the instrument, but really, truly was like something about whatever the harmonic language or exactly. the some the melodic language or something about the actual genre itself, the music, not just the instrument. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah. That's yeah. fascinating. I mean, I I, I I told someone that I'm at the age now where I can say that I, you know Mozart wasn't my favorite composer, <laughs> <laughs> and and the reason for that was it wasn't there were no surprises yeah. to me, and yeah. I think the you know his. Um, compositions were predictable to me, mm -hmm. um, but in early music, the progressions can sometimes evoke more passion and 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 change your mood yeah. um, just by what you're hearing. Yeah. You know, not not by just text, but yeah. music as well. And I found that was very sophisticated for what yeah. I thought was an uh, you know an antiquated lifestyle. <laughs> right, know? right. You raised um, kind of an interesting point about your assumption that everybody had access to or exposure to this music and this musical training as well. And things have changed because more people do now. I mean, you know, Juilliard has an early music school now. And, you know, once upon a time that was unheard of. So once upon a time, 
it was much more uncommon for people to have exposure to these instruments and any kind of training. And, you know, the world of early music and Baroque music really has evolved significantly, even in the recorded music that's available, some of the ensembles that have formed and whatnot. So um, can you speak to that? I mean, you've really, you sort of were riding that wave. You've seen Mm -hmm. that evolution Mm -hmm. happen. Um, And I think it's been influenced by, I mean, you you were a trendsetter to some extent, really, in that you were recording with these important groups and and exposing other people to falling in love with the music as you did. Right. Well, you know, um, when I was coming along, we had one group, the New York Pro Musica here in the United States. And I remember their last concert um, was at Vassar, and it, it, everyone went to hear it. Um, we didn't know it was their last concert, it, oh. it, 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 but most of the people in my class had been influenced by these professors, Janet Knapp and Edward Riley, so mm-hmm. everyone was there to hear it in person. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember Wendy Gillespie said, yeah, right after that, we found out that the Ford Foundation had um, ended our grant. Mm. And a couple of months later, their actual last public concert was given at the Cloisters. Mm-hmm. And I went and I went to that. I managed to get tickets to that. And I went to that. And so I felt that things were, you know, uh, were, were actually folding in terms of an interest in supporting mm-hmm. early music. And I wondered you know, I didn't know what was going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, so I actually felt that once I graduated that I, I felt lost in some mm-hmm. way, which meant that I wanted to find a way to, I wanted to find it again. Mm-hmm. And I'm not, sh- you know, the, 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 the program at Sarah Lawrence, there was a program at New England Conservatory. Um, I thought I'll do that, but I had no idea what was going to happen afterwards. Mm. Um, and l- luckily, the Waverly Consort sort of picked up where the New York Pro Musica ended when Noah mm-hmm. Greenberg died. Mm-hmm. Um, and some of those um, musicians were also uh, in Pro Musica. Mm-hmm. My teacher, Judith Davidoff, was a guest artist with them all the time. So I thought, OK, um, I'll follow the Waverly Consort, which is the next New York Pro Musica. Mm. And it turned out I lived in a neighborhood where they all lived. So it became a social uh, situation where Mm. I would see Lucy Cross crossing the street Hmm. or Wendy Gillespie carrying her vial down (laughs) West End Avenue. Uh, And we all started to, it was a time when we all got together and played informally. Mm -hmm. And through this informal playing, we would end up doing maybe a concert, uh, Mm -hmm. a small concert together. And then you got to know um, people in the groups that they were in because you went to all of their concerts. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, it was important for me to go to every single concert to hear what people were doing Mm -hmm. and and to hear what I liked and to hear what I didn't like about Mm -hmm. what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so that's how that's how it evolved for me. So you are the founder of Aben Music, an ensemble. Could, could you talk a little bit about your group? Sure. Um, this is a string ensemble of two violins and three viola da gambas. Mm-hmm. And we are uh, specializing in um, music written in the 17th century. Um, it gives us a little bit of flexibility because we also are interested in um, uh, working on uh, viol consort music as well. Um, but I always try to make sure that there is some evidence that this music could be played on violins as opposed to treble vials. Oh, and, okay. um, this era uh, with Gibbons and Corporario um, and Lupo, who uh, they were called Corporario's music, they all got together and played uh, together and sampled each other's compositions. But Lupo mm-hmm. was a violinist. Mm-hmm. So um, we have been... Uh, we have a, the flexibility to play the music that features the violin, especially 17th century Italian music. Mm-hmm. Um, there's some German music as well. But um, uh, we also specialize. We did a concert of Dowlin's Lacrimae just about a month ago. 
Um, and we are in the middle of finishing up a recording of the works of William White, who is a contemporary of Gibbons and um, Bird, but he didn't belong to that circle. And his uh, opus of Fantasias are great, but no one has recorded them yet. Oh. So they're in um, two, th uh, three, five, and six parts, mm -hmm. and we're finishing up the six part. Uh, that That's the um, uh, bulk of it. Mm -hmm. We're finishing up the six part works next month um, in recording, and we'll release that sometime in the um, spring. And um, uh, also, um, our violinist is putting together an edition of the music. Oh. Um, we have an edition already, mm -hmm. but he's going to put uh, uh, out an edition of his own, too, that we would um, sort of market along with our recording of, of the music. Wow. That's awesome. I can't wait to have that to share on Sunday Baroque. I, well, <laughs> you'll definitely know about it. <laughs> <laughs> so you're also involved. You mentioned this early music project at Shenandoah University, and that's also a really interesting kind of specific little uh, slice of the mm -hmm. musical world. Could you talk about that? Yeah, um, this is something that I, I have just a peripheral knowledge of, but I worked with David McCormick, who's a violinist, Baroque violinist, at Sh and teaches at Shenandoah University, and we played together in the Washington Box consort. And so I went down to work with him on another project, on a Bach project. But he uh, called me a few weeks later and said that he was putting together, he's been researching and got a grant to research the music collection of Thomas Jefferson at Monticello. And he is putting on a series of concerts that features um, the early colonial music. Um, he's partnering with Lauren Ludwig, who's also doing research on, on that topic. And so in May, he wants to do a concert of that, of music from that collection. And he wants to um, uh, collaborate with as many uh, people of color who play early instruments. Mm -hmm. So that uh, is an interesting um, way to look at that era because we're now beginning to understand that um, Thomas Jefferson's family is quite extended <laughs> and that there were, I, I'm sure there was an opportunity yeah. for um, his African family to also experience the same kind of cultural awareness that his own um, uh, uh, children from his other, the other part of his life. Right, right, right. <clears throat> um, in addition, I had done a recording ages ago with the Boston Camerata called, called Nueva España, uh -huh. and it had the same focus of featuring music by the composers in the New World, which included uh, Haitian composers in Quechua, in uh -huh. Quechua and also uh, South American composers, and Spanish composers who had come over to South America. Uh -huh. and, and that... Uh, recording and concert that we did, he also wanted to feature uh, a number of people of color who were involved in early music. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's interesting to see that progression. Um, what we did back then is now something new again because nothing has happened in between right. to generate an interest in who and what other types of um, communities would have been involved in uh, uh, making music on that level? Right, in, right. It, it is fascinating, and and it is it does take very intentional study. You really have to seek that out. It's not mm -hmm. going to fall into your lap. You really have to make an effort to to do it. And as you say, it's the same now because there hasn't been that effort. Right, and exactly. And now we're seeing more of an initiative to really suss that out. Um, you are not just an amazing performer and starter of ensembles, but you're also you're a teacher. You've you've taught sort of the next generation of of people interested in early music. What are you seeing? What, what's that been like for you? And what do you see in terms of the the changes, maybe, mm -hmm. or the evolution of some of the people who are your students? Well, it's interesting because I um I taught for about 20 years at a private school in New York, the Brerley School. And when I was a student um, in college, I met a, a number of people from Brerley 
who studied recorder mm -hmm. um, and with Ken Wallets. Mm -hmm. So it was a major part of their academic experience. Mm -hmm. And when my daughter went there, um, I was teaching there as well. I remember um, in second grade, they all had to choose an instrument to study. And she said, yeah, they said that if you take the recorder, you don't have to practice. <laughs> so Oops. I was a little concerned <laughs> about how that worked. Um, and when Ken retired, um, I actually stepped in. I was teaching double bass there at that time. Oh. I stepped in and said I'd love to, you know, take on uh, middle school recorders. And when I did, it took me a, a year to dispel that rumor that you didn't have to practice. <laughs> and I was able to, um, I was adamant about uh, putting together a curriculum where they would learn to play uh, Renaissance music. Mm -hmm. And, um, um, of course, I had to slip in a little Harry Potter and now and then. But... Um, uh, the parent, I, I realized the parents were very impressed with the fact that they could play these intricate rhythms, which I consider just natural. But this is something that, um, uh, you know, at, at a certain age, um, kids are fearless. Mm -hmm. And in middle school, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. They pick up languages very quickly. This is another language. Mm -hmm. They were playing a little bit of medieval music. They were playing um, intricate um, uh, uh, Renaissance music without any thought of it, you know, of what it entailed. Because they weren't undoing something in order to, to do something. They right. were just out there fresh as a sponge and yeah. soaking it all in. And uh, I I um, expanded this um to include string students because they have an incredible string program. And so we formed an early music string ensemble, which met at 7 o'clock in the morning before school started. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> and they everyone showed up. I mean, I had at, at the most seven people mm -hmm. in, in an ensemble, and we did um, vile consort repertoire wow. on modern strings. Mm -hmm. And they really, they really got it. They didn't have to undo the problem of vibrato because they hadn't they learned, hadn't it, learned yet. it yet. Yeah, wow, wow. <laughs> and so mm. I was very, um, uh, um, I had a wonderful experience there, and everyone was very supportive and wanted to continue it. Yeah. Uh, um, but you know, unfortunately, I had a full time job as well, mm. and when they changed their schedule um, to a six day schedule, that wasn't going to. Uh, oh. To, to work right now, but uh -huh. um, but uh, I to see and to talk to parents who had never had that experience, it really lent more strength to their curriculum um, yeah. uh, academically mm -hmm. because I also talked about the history involved in some of these sure. pieces. Sure. So um, that is where we can focus on the next generation. Mm -hmm. um, I think it has to start. In, in, in the middle school mm -hmm. um, because by the time you get to college, people are coming with mm -hmm. the expertise on another instrument okay. or they've had that experience. Um, college is where the collegiums blossom. Right. But if you haven't uh, played an instrument as much, then mm -hmm. you hesitate to, you know, jump on that bandwagon and, mm -hmm. and, um, it, it's a it's a it's a difficult thing, but if you are and and it's unique. If you are well versed in it uh, in middle school, uh -huh. it it's as if it really belongs in your repertoire. Right. Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, you know, it's so fascinating to hear you talk about this because I recently interviewed Angelo Moreno. Mm -hmm. Do you know him or of him? So he's Davis High School. It's a public high school in Davis, California. Mm -hmm. And he started a period instrument group for these high school kids. And, and it, it appears, from what we can tell, it's to be the first public high school that offers an early music group. And they play on gut strings with Baroque bows. And they just kind of exactly as you're saying, it's kind of like throwing the kid into the pool and right. having them figure out how to, you know, paddle. And they and they teach them as though this is just sort of another they have a jazz ensemble and they have an orchestra and they have a band and they mm -hmm. have an early music group. And, you know, it's just sort of one of the offerings on the on the curriculum, on the menu, if you will. 
And it's very much the same kind of thing. It's a lot of the same things you're talking about. Vibrato, well, they haven't necessarily learned this yet. And, um, and I will tell you another thing that resonated with what you just said is I'm a flute player. And um, by the time I, I mean, I was eight when I started. And by the time I got to college, where I majored in music as a performance major, I remember thinking, oh, like the, the collegium people, like that was weird. Like for me, like there was no way I was going to have anything to do with that. You know, right. it was a yeah. different, it was like a whole different mindset, let alone different instruments. And so, you know, how ironic that is that, <laughs> that I do what I do now, but, but it's, it, it is uh, something that you either have to be exposed to and, you know, make it sort of part of a tool in your toolkit or, right. or it's going to be a hard sell. You know, it's yeah. going to be difficult to, to try to, you know, get your brain around it yeah i mean i <laughs> I, re- I remember um there was an article once i think in the new york uh, uh, in newsweek and i heard someone quote this again that we were the birkenstock group <laughs> um that every early music musician wore birkenstocks and we were sort of hippies and you know because it was unusual right, um right. but um it, you know, so it wasn't taken seriously. Yeah. And I st- still think there's some kind of stigma with that. Mm-hmm. But it's because it's the unknown. It's like, mm-hmm. you, you know, why are you going to play on gut strings when steel strings are better? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, all these improvements have been made to the instruments so that you can really enjoy the music. Right. But it is, it's not just the instruments, it's the whole history involved. I mean, I was just talking to someone about politics and I said, you know, I think I want to do a concert of music of Philip the Chancellor because it's not only his music, it's his his political philosophy which speaks uh, volumes to what we're experiencing today. And and, and, and all of those things, the same thing with um, the discovery of Hildegard von Bingen by by Sequencia. Um, it's one of those things that can relate to more more people if you can combine the music and the text and lyrics mm-hmm. and the social history that's going on at that time. Yeah. yeah so yeah. it becomes a lot more succinct yeah. um, in that way. Absolutely. Well, Pat Neely, thank you so much for making time to come and chat with me about this. Thanks. This has been wonderful. <laughs> it, 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 it's really great to be able to actually do a retrospective of my own life at this yeah. at this point and yeah. so I thank you for inviting me and what a fascinating and accomplished uh, life and career you have so. <laughs> thank you thank you